So, uh, I'm kind of liking doing these live streams because they're uh, an easy way for me to make content. Uh, JB Peebs, Preps, JB Preps. And uh, in this video, I thought I would do um, sort of an update on the homestead and the garden. We're still in deep winter and uh, I'm gonna show you guys kind of what's going on and some loose plans for my homestead this uh, on this stream. And so what is it today? It's February 22nd, so we're almost the end of the month. And um, yeah, I'm gonna give you guys a little tour of the homestead. This won't be a long stream at all. It's probably pretty short, but I thought I'd make it because it's kind of an easier way to make a video. <laughs> So we'll start, uh, where should I start? Well, some greater context. So I'm in the passive solar greenhouse here and I'm not keeping this space warm right now. It of course is warm when it's sunny out, very warm and the climate battery runs. And so I've been stabilizing the ground temperature in here, which is keeping this from getting cold, but we're about to go into a cold snap. It's supposed to go down to they say minus 25 at night Celsius, which will mean probably for us at this elevation, minus 30. And so I'm not in a rush to plant things because I've prepped two of these beds here and I could plant them now if I wanted to. I could direct seed some spinach in here. I could put some lettuce in here, radishes, peas, I could put stuff like that in here, uh, particularly this bed here that the hammock my kids play in. And I could, I'm gonna put some peas in here very soon, but I'm basically gonna wait until this cold snap finishes until I start uh, putting, putting more stuff in the ground. And um, as far as the nursery is concerned too these days, I'm, because I have so much greenhouse infrastructure, I'm not in a rush to start things early. I found for so many years that I start things early and then they just grow too fast because we're kind of, you know, go outside for a minute here. We're still in winter and, um, you know, <laughs> there's still a lot of snow on the ground. We're a zone five, we're a DFB. So we're sort of a cold Mediterranean climate. We don't get, we're not overly dry but uh we're kind of in the middle we get a i think we get about 30 30 inches of annual rain um, i was saying this in my last one of my last live streams is that um i'm working on some earthworks planning for this property to basically save all of the snow as it melts on here obviously it won't work for this winter but for next winter it will and we're planning to harvest about 7.8 million liters of water just from the snow melt and it might even be more it really just depends on how much i can put into these ponds but so that's kind of our climate zone and uh in the past when i've started things too early i just have way too much stuff too early and it and it and it and uh it doesn't really it doesn't really help it means you get too much stuff at the beginning and then your bed space is occupied by crops that are all ready at the same time and so i found that um being uh, having some reserve with starting stuff in the season is really important so i haven't even started my tomatoes yet i'll go and show you guys um what i have started on the nursery and um but yeah because we have so much greenhouse infrastructure i don't really need to start things early so we got the the high tunnel the unheated high tunnel out there that i can't my the, this wi-fi signal won't reach all the way down there so i'm not going to walk down there right now but um there was really only two things that sur well three things that survived in that greenhouse this year so i learned a good lesson about what i can and cannot do down there what didn't survive in there will survive in this greenhouse next winter but um down there i'm still harvesting spinach i have three beds of spinach in there three kind of short beds of spinach we've been eating all winter and they're actually sprucing up a lot now, uh, which is typical. And uh, we're eating greens from there. The lettuce survived, which I was surprised to see. Uh, it survived as in it overwintered and it'll really start growing in the next couple weeks here, especially after we pass this little cold spell we're gonna go into. And um, my kale kind of survived, but 
not as well as it could. The broccolinis were a failure. Um, the Brussels sprouts were a failure. They just, it just got too cold in there because we were down to minus 32 degrees Celsius here, which is, I think around minus, maybe that's about minus 25 Fahrenheit. So it's, it's, uh, it's pretty cold. So, uh, yeah, not much in there, but because of our hydronic system and what's going on with there, and I'll, I'll, I'll kind of show you guys that as well. Um, we're going to be able to keep this greenhouse warm, uh, this, this coming winter as well. And of course this greenhouse is, we can keep super warm, but the big caveat with a lot of that stuff and the challenge with it is that, um, if you're too warm, say in here, but you're not getting the right daylight, then that becomes a challenge because then you have kind of weird conditions that plants aren't really used to. Oh, we got Roxy girl here. Hey, Roxy, are you shy? Are you shy, Roxy? She's a really friendly dog. She's a good dog. And um, yeah, so it can create sort of weird conditions in here. Uh, but so once our, our hydronic system is fully operational, at this time of year, I would be able to keep this greenhouse completely stable. I'd keep it at probably, uh, I mean, it's not that warm in here at the moment. It's only, uh, it's nine degrees Celsius in here, which is 48 Fahrenheit. And uh, it went down to 40 Fahrenheit or five degrees Celsius last night. So again, I'm not heating this space, but I will be. So these hydronic heaters, there's one there and there's one there, they're forced air. And so they're gonna kind of blow in a cycle um, once the boiler's up and running and um, and so we'll be able to keep this plenty warm. And now, even if you have a greenhouse like this, in our kind of climate, at our latitude, you know, we're like most Canadians, we're 100 miles or so from the US border. And, um, you know, we get, it's fairly, it's fairly dark in the winter. And so there really is a period of time, call it the beginning of December till the end of January, where, unless you're supplementing with light, which isn't economical with our off-grid setup, especially in those two months, unless I just want to burn a ton of diesel to get not that much crop, it's not worth it. So you basically kind of shut this thing down for the most part anyways in, in those two months. But what it does mean is that I can have a really strong start. So because I have these, um, I haven't decided on the sand battery yet. I can see the comments, this is kind of neat. I've never done this before. But because I have these beds and the one down here, I could start really strong. And so that's unfortunately not gonna be this, this spring just because we won't, uh, we're not gonna bother getting the boiler running for this winter. It's just, there's, uh, there's no point of getting it running when my house isn't finished because the boiler's tied into the house. So if I were to try to get it running for this winter, well, I've only got, a few weeks of winter left anyways at best and um, then I'm gonna have to add more glycol water to it and, and rebalance it all next fall anyway so we might as well do that in the fall so that's why we're not gonna bother uh, doing it this year we're kind of just get through the way we've been doing things which is still all right because so in my garage here so you know we're in the greenhouse here it's connected to my garage which is in here and it's a bit of a mess right now but there's my there's my uh, desk Hey, from Gatineau. Um, and so that's where I do a lot of my work. This is my shop in here with uh, my tools and stuff like that. And then I've got a wood stove here as well. So I can keep this space really warm and uh, it's easy to do. That's a, a Blaze King wood stove. It's a fantastic wood stove with a catalytic converter. It's super efficient, can burn for eight hours, no problem. But so what I am doing right now to get stuff started is I've got this little mobile rack here on casters and I, I'm a convert to having everything on casters. But um, so the only things that I've started for the garden this year, uh, and again, last year I just started so much stuff way too early. I had tomatoes that were two feet tall when they were getting transplanted, which was just a drag. It makes it difficult to plant them and then they start really lanky and they're more susceptible to disease and it's, it's just not good. But, um, so this is the only stuff I've started this year. So 
I'm doing way less onions this year than last year. And, uh, and um, I can see you guys' comments coming in. I'm just gonna focus on what I'm talking about and maybe I'll look at the comments after. I won't, we probably won't do this stream too long. But uh, I started onions and I started half the onions that I did last year. I had way too many last year and they didn't make it because my soil is just, is mountain soil. It's really, really um, difficult to uh, get going, but I've got a good firm grasp on it now. I've got all my beds are established. I'll be able to uh, really crush it this season. And every season we'll just crush it more and more. So got onions started. And when I do onions, I do, here, maybe I can flip this thing around. There we go. Can I zoom out? No. So when I do onions, I just do them in open flats. So I do them in two inch deep flats. And then those are perforated. And then it's in a non-perf one inch deep flat, which I use for, for uh, microgreens. And so I just sprinkle onion seed on. And then because they're two inch, they get nice and thick. And then I let them get really big. And then I just break them apart when we go to transplant them. So I've got a flat of uh, red wing onions. Uh, that's my favorite uh, onion, hands down. It's the best storage onion that there is, uh, at least that I've experienced. And then I did another uh, flat of Spanish onions that are more of an onion we'll eat throughout the summer. And then these will be our storage onions. And then I just started a small flat of some really early stuff. So we got some, uh, this is the Seco broccoli, which is an F1. And then this is some winter boar kale. And then this is uh, some celery. So that's all I've started right now. And of course, I'm still doing microgreens. I'm still doing fodder. I've got microgreens going out here. And the kind of neat thing about having these two spaces at the moment is that I can kind of, um, I can separate things. So if I want to, I wanted to slow these microgreens down because I didn't want to plant anymore. I planted too much radish and, and um, I haven't even gone through all those sunflower shoots. So I put them out here. And so it'll get down to like five degrees, you know, just a little above freezing at night with the cold nights we've been having and they'll survive and it'll slow them down. And so the neat thing about having this rack is that on sunny days, I can just bring this out here and just put it into the greenhouse. So it's, and then they'll grow like a mofo, but um, I can keep them warm in here cause it's a lot warmer in the garage because it doesn't have the greenhouse poly, you know, and a lot of people um, are somewhat shocked on how cool it can get in here despite how much infrastructure is with this greenhouse, but it's because this isn't a roof. That's my sun tanning spot too, by the way. <laughs> um, but you know, this is uh, even though we've got two layers of poly, you can kind of see the two layers, but in the center of it, it's about almost three feet apart, but um, it'll lose a lot of heat at night. And uh, that's just kind of part of it. And it's kind of neat actually. During the daytime, up here, I've got, a, I've got a thermostat up there that I can read that's just connected to a whole, uh, some digital infrastructure. During the daytime, on a sunny day, it'll be 10 to 15 degrees warmer up there than it is down there for that one. But at nighttime, it'll actually be sometimes about five degrees cooler up there because at nighttime, all your heat's being lost up here and you're radiating heat from your ground, from the, from the climate battery. So that's kind of a neat thing about this. And, uh, but again, once I have my boiler running and th then it won't be an issue anymore, I'll be able to keep it really nice and stable in here at night, even during the coldest days. But um, until that's up and running, it's not as optimal as it could be. So um, why don't I use a roller blind at night? Because that's a lot of infrastructure and a lot of hassle to set up. That's why. <laughs> Make the case though. You know, when people, when people always ask me, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? It's like, well, why don't you tell me why I should do that first? Uh, and do your best to understand my context. Um, because uh, most people don't fully get their head around the context. And the context is the most important aspect of why something should or should not be done. And so I, so here's the thing with the roller blind. I actually have all the infrastructure. I have a uh, electronic arm and I'll, I'll actually go here and I'll show you how it would work. But there are some technical challenges to it. And I've actually planned on doing this for years. So a roller blind, the only way I can really make this work, um, 
is it has to be outside. Okay, so it has to be here, like this. I get all the disordered. And what you'd have is almost essentially like a roll up side thing. And, and it would roll, it would drive up and down and roll something down over the poly. But the, the biggest challenge with that is, let's say I, I was able to rig that arm up on this, this side here, and then I have a big pole that grows across. Well, this is bowed, this plastic. It's the first challenge because of the, the air being blown in between. And uh, that might be kind of funky and it might dent up. It might, it'll, it'll, it'll make the plastic on the poly for the greenhouse l l not last as long because it'll get all bent every time it rolls up and down. The other challenge is, well, it's snowing right now. And I don't suspect this is going to be a big snowfall. We've had these little breaks of snow and then it gets sunny and we've had some pretty fantastic weather lately. But um, if I had that rolled down, say, because like on, on the front side of the winter solstice, that's when we get most of our snow. And after Christmas holidays, the snow is just kind of here and you get little blasts here and there. But um, what, what happens if I get a huge dump of snow overnight before that rolls up? Well, now it's a real pain in the ass because I'd come and scrape all the snow off. So it's not, it's not simple. That's why. It's not, it's not easy. And then if I wanted to do it, if I wanted to do roller blinds in here, well, look how complicated all of this is. Where do I do that? You know? And, at, and again, at what cost? Every, everything is about, well, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? It's like, okay, well, what does that cost? How long does it take? How complicated is it? Does it create maintenance issues? There's, there's a million reasons uh, to not do it. And so it's better to just have heat. And so that's, that's the plan. No, a little chicken update here since we're out here. So yeah, we crushed it with these hens this year. And uh, Brownie Bob and Blackie Bruce are, um, are just crushing. They're good roosters and uh, they're fertilizing all these hens. Some hens more than others. You can see by just the... Uh, their backs, the ones that are really getting sessioned, <laughs> have, um, oh, look at this, three, three laying right now. They're uh, the ones that have the feathers off their backs are the ones that the, uh, the roosters like. And so they're having their way with them. But, you know, some people ask uh, and are surprised, for, you know, for people who live in warmer climates, can't get their head around how you can have chickens in sub-zero temperatures. So our lowest temperature we got down to this winter was minus 34 Celsius, which is very, very cold. <laughs> that is, you know, Celsius and Fahrenheit line up at minus 40. So it's close to minus 40 Fahrenheit. I don't understand how that works. Fahrenheit doesn't make any logical sense to me, but whatever. Um, you know, how do these chickens stay warm at night with a completely open air coop? It up roosts we got and uh oh, we're lagging a bit here okay there we go and they snuggle together and they keep each other warm and it's it's great and um you know we have we have 16 hens and two roosters so there's 18 birds all together and uh that's a good amount of chickens i i know people who have less chickens than me and then have these fancy coops that are built off the side of their house and there's just so much space and there's so much area to clean the thing that i love about this coop is that it's small it's movable i'm going to move it to different garden plots throughout the year this year and it's just enough space for the chickens because i don't want the chickens spending the majority of their time in the coop i only want them in the coop when they're laying eggs or if they're going to sleep otherwise i want them outside um in this case for winter they spend most of the greenhouse though i do have this open and they're now starting to explore around which is totally fine. They know where their food is, so they always come back. And uh, the coop itself is is uh, is safe from from animals. I mean, if a bear came at this, it could probably tear doors off and stuff. But our fence keeps bears out, so we're not worried about bears anymore. But our only threat to uh, the birds up here would be a cougar, perhaps in the winter, but highly unlikely. And uh, our, our number one predator would be a skunk, and and they just can't get in here because it's all sealed up. This this ch chicken door opens up automatically at uh, six thirty a.m. and it closes at seven p.m. 
And so the chickens, they all get in every night. They know where to be and they know where it's warm and they know where to be safe. And so, but uh, yeah, so the chickens, it's been unbelievably successful. We're now collecting like 12 eggs a day. And these chickens are pullets, right? They're, they're just one year birds. And um, we're gonna, uh, I'm going to incubate a bunch of new chickens this year. And I'm going to create, um, I'm gonna let some of them go broody. And I'm going to uh, let the broody ones, we're gonna do the whole thing. There's so many videos on YouTube that have been so helpful. But I'm gonna bring that, bro that first broody hen, I'm going to put on one of these little garden beds. And I'll probably just put a little, some chicken wire around it, make a little box place for that chicken to get broody. And then she can raise those, that first batch of chickens in one of these beds. So uh, that's what we're gonna do. Is there feces good for manure? Yeah, totally. Um, and uh, yeah, that's what's going on with the chickens. So again, you can see when we start, lots of, lots of snow is starting to melt. The ice is kind of breaking through. So, you know, spring is coming. And uh, here, let's check out the boiler. I, hope, I think the internet signal should still be good. So this is my boiler shack. I, I, I worked on this for quite a while. We poured the slab for it. And again, this is where this solar panel here used to be here. And I just hated it. I didn't like the way it looked. It didn't balance out with these. It got shaded out for about a month on half of it. And so um, I wanted to do a boiler anyways, so it all made sense. And this doesn't get shaded at all, believe it or not. It's amazing. And I, I, I made sure that when I built this structure that I was bang on with those calculations of where the sun would be in the winter, and I was, so it all worked out really well. But so this is my, uh, this is my boiler generator shack. So we talked about the generator behind the tidy tank there, which is enclosed in previous videos. And then this is the boiler shack. And uh, this is the boiler. So it's not, not finished yet. The plumbing's not all done. The hydronic lines that go to this are here, and then those deliver um, glycol water to everywhere. And uh, we still have to put the chimney in here, which will punch, punch through the roof. And yes, most people don't put boilers in um, shacks like this, and uh, I did it a little differently. But this thing is sweet. I mean, you got so much cubic space for wood in here, and... Uh, yeah, it's going to be sweet. And it's totally automated in that uh, it, you know, it throttles itself based on the demand for water on the supply lines that go out. And um, it runs according to its need. So it's really, uh, it's really sweet. And then there's, there's the plumbing that we've begun, the pumps and everything. And so we'll just slide this over, connect it to this line. So one of these lines, these are... Um, this is called thermal pex and so one of these lines goes to the hothouse the cabin and the greenhouse so one one line supplies all those things and the reason for that is that the cabin and this need minimal heat the objective is to only keep them above freezing so when we're not living in the cabin and it's sort of a guest suite I just want to keep it from freezing so I don't have to blow out all the lines and do all that stuff. I don't have to winterize it. And then this, I just want to keep this above um, freezing as well. And then this will take the, the lion's share of, call it the half of those BTUs available for the uh, garage and greenhouse. And then the other line goes underneath the ground here to the house. So half of the, the house or half of the boiler will be, most of the boiler will be feeding the house, really. And, um, yeah, and then, uh, what else here? Yeah, so the sand battery, and I, I'm not 100% on the sand battery. I'm glad I put it out to you guys, but, uh, yeah, so this is underground. This is from our well, which is underneath that pile of snow. It's all eight feet underground. This is where all, all of our utilities will go into the back of the house. But the sand battery or whatever it might be is gonna be over here behind this panel. And, um, but again, I'm not 100% on the sand battery. Um, and again, I'm glad that I 
had some people chime in because you know I don't I can't have my glycol water turned to steam otherwise that's a nightmare so I'm still trying to get my head around the whole thing and uh none of it's set in stone so um that boiler is a is called a central boiler that's the name of the company it's a classic edge 560 um no the broccoli that I'm starting is going to be in the greenhouse it'll go into this high tunnel this year I'm going to do all of my uh early spring and winter crops in here and the tomatoes and peppers will all go in that tunnel this year that's how I'm going to do it yeah, no, it's a central boiler, classic edge 560. It's a 200,000 BTU unit, and it is under spec for basically our total square footage. But because I have other heating sources in all of these buildings, I'll be able to um, uh, I'll be able to have flexibility where I put that heat. So that's the kind of thinking there, and. Um, yeah, what else can I show you guys? Here, well, maybe I'll answer a few questions and then um, we'll shut this one down. Yeah, so all this stuff that I'm starting right now, except the only thing that's going to go in the field of this stuff that I started is the onions. All this stuff here is just going to... Uh, I'm going to plug this phone in because it's going to die. Um... We'll go in the greenhouse. The, the onions are the only thing going in the field. And I'll probably start my tomatoes early March this year. Um, again, it, it, I'm in no rush to do it because it's... Um, I have so many greenhouses that things just grow really fast anyways. Okay, look at this. Oh, this is neat. <laughs> I'm going to put this down. And then I can look at your guys' chat. Are you going to do a 2023 seeds video like you did last year? Yeah, I'll probably do that for, yeah, I'll do that for From the Field um, when I'm ready to do, to start more stuff. Um, but I'm not quite ready to start all that stuff, so I won't do that just yet. Um, this is great, now I can look at the computer. Um, what's the pump size? that runs the water for that boil. I'm not sure. I don't really want to go back out there. You could just look it up. Um, Chris, I have a question about Napa cabbage, and if so, any recommendations? I have a hard time getting to do anything. I don't know, it's pretty easy for us. You know, sometimes in, if you're in a warm climate, that's probably it. TT says, dude, I'm ready for spring. The past, yeah, man, I'm over this winter. <laughs> Um, yeah, this winter has been quite gnarly. No, no question about it. Um, this is a 15 minute city. <laughs> it, it, you, you know what? It kind of is. Our homestead is its own little 15 minute city. And you know, that's one thing that's kind of funny about, um, you know, people, um, People will hate on me for having a Tesla and stuff like that. And, and one thing, people keep commenting that my Tesla's full of EMF. It's like, where are you getting that from? It's not. It's not actually. Uh, my meter in my Tesla shows that it's it's a medium range. You get more you get more EMF standing downtown in a city like Kelowna than you do in our Tesla. Um, but uh, no, the way I see it is we're sort of hedging our bets. So I like electrical infrastructure, and I've got a really sweet. I can't wait to show you guys when I get it. Um, I've kind of partnered up with, uh, Curly from Curly's Ag and he builds that electric Clydesdale. It's like a, it's like an electric BCS really. I've got one coming. And so big, big part of the reason I, I, I like electric infrastructure so much is number one, I'm not worried about an EMP. That's bullshit. It'll never happen. Um, and another is I'm hedging my bets because the new world order wants to eliminate petroleum and they can do that. They can turn off the petroleum e easier than they can turn off the sun sunshine. Though they try, <laughs> they try with the sunshine, but uh, it doesn't really work. I can, even on the cloudiest days, I still get solar panels. So the way I see it is I'm kind of hedging my bets is that, yeah, Greta Thunberg and Klaus Schwab and all these cronies, they want to shut down uh, petroleum and 
I think there's a good chance of them doing that because it's such it's so centralized. Whereas when you're off grid, you got solar, you got a generator, or you you can do other ways to you know I, I'm interested in other ways to generate electricity. Potential not not really gasification. I'm kind of over it with gasification, but maybe steam. There is um, uh, there's all kinds of ways to generate electricity, and so I think it's really coming down to hedging our bets. And yeah, somebody just commented. EMP would knock out all their infrastructure. Of course, that's how they control everybody is through electronics and technology. So why would they EMP you? Because then they would lose their entire control grid. EMP will never happen. Uh, neither will nuclear war, mark my words. It'll just be, it'll just be what you see in the news. Curtis? So, hey my love. Do you mind if I borrow from you? Yeah, I will. I just, didn't you see my text? No. Okay, yeah, I'll be there. I'll be there shortly. Um, an EMP would, yeah. Good, good luck, right? So, what else? And then I'm gonna shut this one down. What's my favorite, favorite potato variety? Yukon, 100% Yukon Gold, best keeper. Um, do you think chemtrails is to suppress solar? Um, solar power, no. No, I think, I don't know why they do it. I think it's most, I've heard that it's insurance companies doing it. Um, but who knows? Like the only, the only things I ever proclaim to know when I get into the so-called gravy is stuff that I've read directly from the words of the government or the World Economic Forum or the Bilderberg Group or Charlotte Commission, whatever. I read their white papers. And so I think a lot of people speculate on things and, and I find that kind of annoying, frankly. So why do they do it? I don't know. It, it could be because it's a climate change corporate virtue signal. I don't know, but I can see it happening. And um, that's right. Uh, Curtis, my name might be constitutional remedy, but that doesn't mean I give out or sell any remedy. Please don't conflate the two. I have an interest. Yeah, man, I wasn't thinking about you, to be honest. <laughs> I don't, okay. Um, as long as you can survive without the city, even just getting by, how do, how do they commercially use the sand better without steaming the glypho? I don't know. I think a lot of the, the bigger ones are probably pumping air through it. So, um, yeah. EMP could happen from a solar fire. Yeah, okay. I'm not holding my breath on that one. People have, people just, want to freak out about things. People just want to um, have things to be worried about. And I'm just kind of like, I don't worry about any of it. Uh, I just take action. And so, um, yeah. Our, our waste goes into uh, compost toilets. So we don't have a septic, we do all compost toilets. When we build the house, we are gonna, I'm gonna plumb in tri traditional um, stuff, but I'm not going to use it. It would just be for perhaps later if we wanted to do that. So anyways, folks, that's been our garden update. I'm gonna shut this one down and hope you guys have an awesome day. See you in the next one.